Well, good morning, uh, Rooted Fellowship. It is good to be with you this morning. Uh, I was really hoping to see you uh, physically, um, but it is what it is. We are here on Zoom. Um, my name is Sihia, for those who might not know me. I get a privilege of leading a church plant in, uh, in Joburg, in, jo- in Johannesburg, in the Greenstone, Greenstone Motorfontein area. Um, but Rooted is, is a home for me. I, I train there as a church planter, so it's always good to be with you. We're going to be starting a series on Advent, Uh, starting a series that we're going to be carrying through uh, this couple of weeks that are coming. Um, What I'm going to do right now, I'm going to read a a text for us that we'll be on today, and then I'm going to pray for us, and then we will get on today's sermon. Let me read for us. If you've got a Bible with you, grab your Bible, grab your phone, or wherever you want to read. We're going to be on Luke 1, Luke 1 from verse... 46, from verse 46 to verse 46. I'm going to read for us, and then we will, we will pray, and then we will get in God's word. Luke 1, from verse 46. It says, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength from shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the the proud in the thoughts of their thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is life. It is a living word. And I pray that even as we get into your word this morning, the Lord, you will speak to us. For those of us who are um, feeling exhausted, feeling um, in despair, the Lord, your word will lift us up. Point us to your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray be encouragement to our souls this morning, because we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I thought I'll start a sermon. I thought I'll start this, this sermon with um, showing us a picture. I think it will show on the screen right now. Uh, there's a picture with uh, just different cars. I think you can see it on the screen now. Uh, this picture has different cars. I think it's like, what, three, four, three six, nine cars. Uh, I, I like what I, what I want us to do, to do a quick exercise, to look in, in, at these cars, or I mean it's a one car but with different, um, showing different things, to look at this car or different cars and see which one will resemble your life right now. If you see you've got a car that is covered, you've got a car that is so almost like the engine is burning, you've got a car with a, with a puncher, you're covered, different, the car that is you know, there's a celebration happening here. I mean, looking at these cars, which one will resemble you? Which one will resemble you? Let me give us 10 seconds to look at these cars. Which one resembles you? The reason why I'm doing this is that it's good to, to get to God's word with our honest selves. It's always good to get word. What, what this does, what this picture does, it actually excavates our inner reality. What's really happening within us? And I, and I want us to start this sermon with our real selves. Now, getting to God's word, it's saying, God, this is where I am. I'd like you to speak to me where I am. I could be this car who's got a puncher. I feel like my life is just, nothing is happening. I feel like I'm covered up, like that car with, with just sort of covered up. I, I, I feel like I need sort of an unveiling. I'm, I'm underground. Um, I could be this car that's celebrating so much joy. Wherever I am, I'm coming to the Lord as that. It's been a tough, it's been a tough year, tough year for most of us. And what that does is that as we end off this year, it, it leaves us with more questions than answers. It leaves us with uh, us coming face to face with our expectations and reality. 
what we expected and what happened. Some of us expected a lot of things this year. And as the year ends, we are faced with those questions to say, I expected things to be different. I expected things to be, to change. You know, for some of us, we could have expected, um, whether it's work situation, financial situation, to be different. You know, as the year ends, I thought I would have saved this much. I thought I would have had work. I thought my marriage would be better. I, I, I thought I would have overcome this sinful behavior by now. I thought something would have happened. And what the year ends does is that it gets us, and some of us, it gets us into despair. To say, here we go again, the year has ended and nothing has changed. Have I made progress? Have I made progress this year? And some of us are asking those questions. And, and, and for some, they could just be, literally be, just be questions that we ask ourselves and then we move on with our lives. But for some of us, it could lead us into some sort of crisis. Like deep existential questions to say, here I go again and my life has not moved forward. And what I've come to understand is that our deeper questions, you know, we, we ask ourselves all of this uh, sort of questions that, we, we, that are, you know, show that we are in crisis mode, but most of our deepest question ac across the board is not whether, you know, where is God or whether God exists, especially for those who are Christians, but even for those of us who might be watching and who are not Christians, who are wrestling with that question, whether God exists or not, um, I'd like to put it, put it to, to all of us that our, our question is not just that, but the real question is, the deep question behind whether God exists or not, the deepest question is, is God in the midst of all of this? Whatever all of this is in your life, is God in the midst of the mundane things that are happening in my life? Is God really in my life? Is God working in my life? That's the real question that we are asking ourselves. Is God in the mundaneness of our life? Is he doing something? And sometimes uh, at Christmas... I mean, we are in this season of Advent, the season of sort of a Christmas season, as I can put it. The, sometimes Christmas and this season can feel meaningless for some of us. It can feel meaningless because it, it, it comes almost like an escape in the face of real life. It comes as, you know, we've been just grinding it on as, as, as people and with everything that's happened in this life, and sometimes we feel like we're defeated, so many things have happened in our lives, and now we have to put that on pause because it's Christmas. We have to celebrate, you know, it's festive season, all of these things, and we'll come back again in January with the grind again. You know, and therefore for some of us, for some people, it, it can feel like Christmas is just this something that's meaningless in the face of real life. We are in a pandemic, Petrol is up, uh, you know, for some of us, our relationships are in a mess. For some of us, different things are in a mess. Some of us lost work, all of these things. But Christmas season says, let's pause all of that because it's Christmas time. We'll press play again in January. It can feel like it is meaningless, which is why I like Advent. Which is why I like Advent, because Advent is not just a fancy, cool word for a Christmas season. You don't want to use a Christmas season, you use Advent. It's not just a cool word for Christmas season. It, Advent is actually an entire different approach to looking at this season. It's an entire different approach. Advent, it means that we, we get in touch with our deepest longings, with our greatest hopes. That's what Advent is about. Advent is the word that means arrival. It's the word that talks about the arrival, the coming of Jesus. And, and what Advent does, it, it gets us to prepare our hearts and our minds and our souls for the arrival of, of God with us, for the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah. We are supposed to, to feel the weight, to feel the weight that the people felt when Jesus came. 
to feel the weight that we are feeling right now, anticipating the second coming of Jesus. Advent is, is this tension that we live in uh, between that Jesus has come and Jesus is still to come again. We're supposed to feel this tension to anticipate the coming of something or someone that will change our lives completely. And therefore, Advent is supposed to get us in touch with our deepest longings, our deepest hopes. Gets in touch with us to say, what does, how do we live life in a waiting period? That's what Advent is about. How do we live life in a waiting period? Because in the moment of waiting, in the moment of waiting, God does something more in our waiting, sometimes more than actually what we are waiting for. Let me say, let me say that again. In, in the moment of waiting, God does in us, in our waiting, what God does in us, in our waiting, can be more important than what we actually are waiting for. God does in us in our waiting. And there's a sense that we all have some sort of longing, some sort of waiting for something. And friends, we don't run away from waiting. Now, I know most of us, practically, we don't like waiting. I mean, just think about it. What do you do when you get to your queue, whatever, in a supermarket or whatever? You know, you've got, you know, 10 uh, tills that you could go for. You go for the, the shortest queue. You don't want to wait. You know, most of us, we get to a place that's a long queue. We just don't like waiting, practically. But the, 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 the reality of life that we get to wait we get to wait for different things, and we get to wait with things in our lives. And God has wired us in such a way that waiting does something in us. God does something in us in our waiting. So today we start our Advent series with a song of Mary. With the song of Mary. And what we see, in fact, we're going to look at the song of Mary uh, next week and, and others, there'll be other songs, song of Zechariah, song of Simeon. And all of these songs, these are songs of real people in real life with real issues, but they find real joy in the coming of Jesus. They're finding real joy in the coming of Jesus, real people. Now, I want us for this Advent to get as real as possible. Sometimes, again, as I mentioned, even with the Christmas messages at church, all of these things, they can feel so abstract. You know, we're talking about the incarnation, the coming of Jesus, and it doesn't come right to our living rooms. I want us for this Advent to be as real as possible. As we see here in the Song of Mary, Mary is this teenage Jewish girl from Nazareth, this obscure village in Galilee. This is a real person, this teenage Jewish girl from Nazareth. And something strange, something divine happens to her. An angel visits her. An angel visits her and tells her something remarkable that is about to happen. Evil, an angel visits her and tells her that she will be pregnant. That the Messiah will be born through her. God will be incarnate through her. What? Like, like I'm, to, I'm talking about real person, real time. Now, I don't know if you've ever had friends who have visited by angels. You know, I, 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 I do have friends like that. I do. Maybe some of you don't. And, 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 and I really, sometimes I take them with a pinch of salt. You know, people who are visited by angels now and again. Now, I'm not saying that's not possible here. We, we see it. But there's a sense that, you know, sometimes I do that because there's a sense that maybe I want that. You know, I want an angel story. Who doesn't? I, I, I want to tell people about my angel story. We all want an angel story. She gets the angel story. Mary gets this angel story. 
And what's hectic about this angel story, the, 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 the divine revelation, that's what it is. It's just this messenger who comes from God, this divine revelation. What it does, sometimes we want angel stories, but what angel stories do to us is that they change our trajectory forever. When you get that divine revelation to say, this is what, where you are, this is where you're supposed to go, it is supposed to change your trajectory forever. Mary had hopes. Mary had dreams. She had hopes of getting married to Joseph. She had hopes of having kids, normal kids, married to a carpenter, Joseph, having a normal life in Nazareth or Gal in Galilee. But now, all of that has to change. Her angel story, this divine revelation has to change. And what's remarkable about her is that although she's anxious and baffled about this, that the Messiah will be born through her, although she's anxious and baffled about all of this, I mean, she asks, how could this be? She asks, how could this be? That's just a euphemism for that's impossible. That's literally her saying that that's impossible. How could this be? But by the end of all of that, she says, may it be according to your word. She surrenders to this divine revelation. She surrendered to this divine revelation. Now, again, most of us don't get angel stories, but we do get some, song, some sense of divine breaking in into our reality now and then. We do get that whisper from God. It might not be an angel coming and speaking to us. I mean, sometimes we think an angel, you know, speak with this loud voice, you know, Mary, Mary. We don't know. It could have been a whisper. But this angel, I mean, we, but for us, we get these uh, divine breaking in into our reality, sometimes like a whisper or some sense of deep knowing that God has said something to you. A whisper saying, when are you going to forgive that person? A whisper saying, I don't know what, I don't, I don't, I know you don't want to, but you need to do this and things will change forever for you. Have you, have you, do you, do you get that whisper? Have you, have you gotten that whisper from God? Maybe a voice saying, I don't think you should give up on yourself yet. You're not over. Do that project again. Love again. Do the thing again. Have you ever had that whisper? That's a divine breaking in into our reality. And those things are supposed to change us forever. They're supposed to change our trajectory forever. How is the divine breaking into your reality right now? What is God whispering to you? Sometimes we can look at the story of Mary, this angel coming to her and think that this is like once in a lifetime thing, but this is just reality. God gives us this divine breaking in, these whispers, this deep knowing. Question is, what is it to you right now? And Mary moves from being anxious and doubtful, how can this happen? She moves to rejoicing, to singing. Man, if, if, if only we knew how possible that is, how possible to, to move from anxiety, from doubt, to rejoicing. To move from uncertainty to singing. If only we knew that that is possible. Friends, we all have a song to sing. We do, really, we do. We all have a song to sing. The thing is, fear convinces us not only that we don't have a song, but it, it convinces us that we only have to sing when things are perfect. Whisper tells us that you can only sing when things are perfect. You need to have a right mood, right surrounding, right everything must be perfect. But that's not the goal of a song, by the way. The goal of a song is not this perfection. The goal of a song is to relay whatever God has put into you. Fear convinces us that the best way to deal with our vulnerabilities is through hiding them, 
through this thick casing of not being perfect. We are not being perfect and therefore we need to hide our vulnerability and our weaknesses. But God shows us that the best way to deal with our vulnerabilities is to sing a song through them, through our vulnerabilities, passing through your heartbreak, passing through your doubts, your passions, your failures, your secrets and joys. That's what makes your song special. You don't have to wait till things are perfect. You can sing right now, and Mary does that. From anxiety, she rejoices to sing. God wants you to start singing. Through your imperfections, through your vulnerabilities, through your heartbreaks, through your doubts, God wants you to start singing. And Mary starts singing here. What, 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 does, what is this song about? Let's look at this song. Quickly, two things that we see in the song. Firstly, the songs, it shows us the favor of God towards Mary in her humble estate. It shows us favor towards Mary, God's favor towards Mary in her humble estate. But secondly, it shows God's lack of favor towards the powerful and the prideful. God's favor towards the humble and God's lack of favor for the powerful and prideful. Let's look at the first one. God's favor towards the humble, towards Mary in her humble estate. It says, Mary magnifies the Lord, and, and, and my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, because he has looked with favor on the humble condition of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed, because the mighty one has done great things for me, and his name is holy, his mercy from generation to generation on those who fear him. I mean, Mary is the least candidate to give birth to the Messiah. She is. She's a teenager living in Nazareth. Nazareth was where you go when you have no chance of advancement. You know, it's almost like, you know, everyone comes to Joburg, everyone comes to Gauteng, and you, God does something in an obscure village somewhere. I won't say in, in which province. You know, just in a place where people leave to come to a different place. Nazareth was a place where you go, where you, you're not looking for advancement. But here's a teenager that God intentionally chooses to give birth to the Messiah. God looks into this impoverished teenager and sees his choice sees his choice for someone who will bring the Messiah. And from doubt, understandably, Mary had doubt about this. From doubt, Mary ends up with a song, rejoicing that God has redirected her story. God has redirected her story. This young, humble teenager with, with nothing to her name, nothing to her offer, nothing in her resume. But God chooses her. God redirects her story forever. And, and here's an important truth we learn about God here. God does not look for the strong. In, in fact, we see this throughout the scriptures. God does not look for the strong. God does not look for the capable. God gives grace to the humble, to the weak, to the vulnerable. As we look throughout the scripture, we see God is drawn to the weak. God is drawn to those who don't have things put together. God is drawn to those. In fact, even God himself follows this example by showing his might through humility. By the Lord Jesus coming and being a human. The, the weakness of being born. The, the God himself coming down and being born and being weak and being vulnerable as a baby. The vulnerability of suffering as he lives his life. The vulnerability of dying as a suffering servant. In this humility and vulnerability, this is the mighty ground that God serves the world through. God saves us through the humility of Christ, through this vulnerability of Christ, through the sufferings of Christ. 
Everybody. In fact, in, at the time, that was the whole confusing about the Messiah. There is no way this is the Messiah. I mean, I remember with Philip, he, he, they, told, they talked about here's the Messiah coming from Nazareth. They say, from Nazareth? Nothing good comes from Nazareth. It's an obscure place. But God chooses to use this vulnerability, these places of weakness. I like what Scott Erickson says in his book of Honest Advent. He says, could it be that the doorway to experiencing God with us, this Advent is the particular vulnerability we find ourselves facing? Whether it's health, heart, or home, our lives will always have a particular vulnerability to them. May we not see this vulnerability as the place of failure because of our inability to overcome it, but as the very invitation to engage with God through it. This is what Scott Erickson says. Could it be the doorway to experiencing God with us this Advent is through vulnerability. It's through vulnerability. There's, there's, it's an invitation to engage with God. Because we see here God shows favor to the humble, to the weak. But secondly, God withholds his favor from the prideful. He withholds his favor from the prideful. It says, he has done a mighty deed in his arm. He has scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. This is the contrast. He shows favor to the humble. But he is not in favor with the proud. He resists the proud. He scatters the thoughts of the proud. Meaning, in fact, what it means is this, those who think they don't need God, as a rejection, God's let them continue in their delusion. God withholds his favor by letting them continue in their delusion. The worst thing that God can do to a person is to let them be. That's, that's the worst thing that God can do, is to let them be not to intervene in their lostness. He topples the mighty from their thrones. He's talking here even with the nations, even with the kings, the, the nations. What we see here is the cosmic res, the reversal caused by this coming of this Messiah. The coming of Jesus has started this reversal, which will be fully realized at the end in his second coming, but it has started. He has started this reversal when things, the value system of this world, he's turning it upside down. In the coming of Jesus, Jesus is turned, God is turning upside down the value systems that we think we should have. Our world, our culture values the rich. It values the mighty. It values the well-known. But Jesus and his kingdom, that value system is different. The hungry are satisfied. The rich go away empty. Do you see the difference? In fact, if you see in the Beatitudes, we see that. Th those who are hungry, those who are thirsty, those who know their need, those are the, the blessed ones. The meek, those are the blessed ones. This is the way of the kingdom. It's an upside down kingdom. The hungry are satisfied, the rich go away empty. The ones who know they are vulnerable and needy, those are filled. Those are satisfied. The ones who got it all together, they'll go away empty. And these are the two themes of Mary's song. God gives favor to the humble, but at the same time, God withholds his favor to the pride, to the prideful. And she rejoices and praises the Lord because the coming of Jesus brings this reversal. So here's the thing. Advent, uh, to some of us, Advent should bring comfort but to some of us, it should bring a warning. Advent should bring a com comfort to others, but bring a warning to others. Because there are those of us who are proud and there are those of us who are humble. 
to the weak, to the vulnerable, to the hungry, Advent is going to bring comfort. To those who are proud, who are proud, who've got it all together, Advent brings a warning. And where are you in that spectrum? Are you low and in need of the gospel to lift you up? Or are you high and self-sufficient and need the gospel to bring you low? First, let me me comfort the lowly. Let me bring comfort to those who are low. If you are at the end of yourself, maybe, maybe in that picture of cars, you were the one with the puncture. The one carrying a heavy load. Maybe you are low spiritually. Maybe in 2021, you went into sin further than you have ever gone. You've you, you done things that you have said to yourself, I will never stoop that low. I will never do that. In 2021, you did it. Maybe you are carrying the burden of guilt, of shame, from, from, not, from a non-existent spiritual life. Maybe your spiritual life has, has come into non-existent. Are you low because of that? Maybe some of us are relationally impoverished. Impoverished. 2021, you you, you had friendships that you lost. Marriage that was at, at the lowest it has ever been. Situationships that hurt you. And no Christians get into situationships. Situationships that hurt you. Are you low because of that? Maybe you're feeling emotionally low. Loss and grief and life drained you emotionally. Are you there? Are you low and humbled this year? Vulnerable in a weak place? If so, God's word to you in the coming of Jesus is comfort. God's word to you in the coming of Jesus is comfort. He sees you. He sees your pain. He comes to people like you. He looks upon you with gracious attention. He's drawn to you. Your loneliness is what draws him. He's drawn to you. God is not ashamed This is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer says. He says, God is not ashamed of human lowliness, but but he goes right into the middle of it. He performs the miracles right there when they are least expected. God draws near to the lowly, the disillusioned, the unnoticed, the unremarkable, the excluded, the powerless, and the broken. What people say is lost, God says it is found. What people say is condemned, God says it is saved. Where people say no, God says yes. Where people turn their eyes away in difference and arrogance, God gazes with love that glows warmer than anywhere else. Praise be to God. He looks upon the humble. And in this Advent, he wants to meet you there. Does God care about the mundane things in my life? Ordinary, bills piling up, nowhere, not where I want to be type of life of mine? Yes, he does. He wants to meet you in your ordinary life, in your vulnerability. But for some of us here this morning, we need to hear a word of warning. A word of warning. Many, many, many maybe if, 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 you know, if we're honest, 2021, we got to realize that we are actually capable. We got this life thing figured out. Career is going well. We are crushing it in every, in every aspect of life. For those of us like that, Advent is a warning. Advent is warning, showing you that the value system of God's kingdom is slanted against those who rejoice in their own self-sufficiency. God withholds his favor to those people. You need to humble yourself before God. And by the way, I do recognize that sometimes it, it can be hard to recognize that you are proud towards God. You know, so even that, most of us are saying, yeah, I'm the humble one, I'm the low one. No one is going to say that, uh, yeah, actually, I'm crushing it. It's hard to recognize our pride. 
But here's some quick indicators that you could be there. Lack of prayer. Lack of prayer screams self-sufficiency. Repelling community. That screams unaccountability. You're not accountable. You're doing things in your own terms. Lack of rest. Lack of Sabbath. Rest. You are the one in control. You can't rest. You can't you know, just shut down. You can't do that because everything is going to crumble because you are the one in charge of everything. Lack of prayer, lack of community, lack of rest. Just some indicators that you are proud, that you are proudful. Humility is the key of joy in Advent. The wonder of Advent is the humility of Jesus. What we see here, what, what motivates us to be that humble because we see the humility of Jesus. Advent helps us to stare at the humility of Jesus. We can stare at the humility of Jesus. Christmas and this Advent season is an invitation to know Christ personally in his humility. It's an invitation by God to say, look what I've done to come near you. Now draw near me. I don't want to be a concept, God says. I want to be your friend. Look what I've done to come near you. I've come into the person of Jesus. The greatest glory is a person who gives up his glory to save others. And we say that in Jesus. The greatest strength is to become weak to save others. We see that in Jesus. We get to stare at the humility of Christ. And the humility of Christ, the kingdom that he brings, it shows us that everything now is in reversal. The way up is to go down. The way to be rich is to give things away, is to be generous. To have power and influence, and influence is not to domineer, but it's to sacrifice for others. The way to be happy is to stop thinking about your own happiness, but to help others to be happy. The way to rule is to serve. You see the reverse of the kingdom? You see the reverse of the kingdom that Jesus brings. And in this advent, God shows that in Christ, a new, hum new humanity has begun. The humanity, the humanity that goes low to go up. That serves to be powerful. That gives to get. That, that take away their, their selves, their all selves, to gain their real selves in Christ. Would you be humble this Advent? If you are in that low space, would you engage with God there? Would you sing a song through your vulnerabilities, through your pain? Would you invite Jesus in? to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that your word brings life to us. Thank you that we get to celebrate the coming of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. I pray that even as we think through this time of his coming, that Lord, you will do something in us, that in our waiting, wherever we are, you will change us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.